everybody. Good evening. I'm Judy, the YouTube vlogger here today, more as a skating fan. I'm on the road. I'm in a hotel on the way to Tennessee, but my plans have kind of been messed up because of all the snow and the ice on the roads out near the Tennessee, North Carolina border. So unfortunately, I'm going to probably be stuck in this hotel room again tomorrow and then not be able to drive to Nashville until Saturday to watch the events live. So today's episode or today's live stream, if anybody out there actually cares about figure skating, I'm not sure what percentage of my viewership is here for the legal content versus the Asian American content or maybe a smidgen of skating info. But um, I'd like to focus on a question that has been addressed here and there, which is um, why are there so many Asian Americans that are into figure skating now? Because, you know, in the past you have seen or maybe you've heard of Christy Yamaguchi, the Olympic gold medalist back in 1992, um, as well as, of course, Michelle Kwan, five-time world champion. Um, how many times was she the U.S. national champion? I used to know that. I think it's probably eight or nine times, but um, don't hold me to that. By the way, congratulations to Michelle Kwan. I just found out yesterday that she gave birth to a beautiful little girl. So congratulations to her and the Kwan family. Um, and then now um, there were some articles about how so many of the U.S. team for figure skating back at the last Olympics back in 2018 were of Asian descent. Um, same thing now. We still have Nathan Chen, the reigning world champion. And now he is really being chased by Vincent Zhou, who is also Chinese American. They're both children of immigrants from China. So um, who knows if Vincent will be able to win his first national championships. That would be amazing too. I'm a fan of both of them. They're both incredible athletes. Actually, you know, I don't want to criticize anybody or seem like I'm down on any particular athlete because Anybody who has made it to nationals or to national level or even sectionals, well, they don't do sectionals anymore. Um, that is just totally amazing. What a triumph as an athlete to have made it to such a high level of competition. So, um, so in this competition, U.S. Nationals 2022, besides Nathan and Vincent, since I refer to them by their first names, we also have Karen Chen and Alyssa Liu, both vying for the title. Karen and Alyssa are both former U.S. national champions, and Karen also went to the Olympics. She placed fourth in the most recent world championships. Um, so there's just a bunch of other people. I'm not going to name all of their names, but they are actively competing at the U.S. national figure skating championships, and they do have some, or uh, they are of Asian ancestry. So um, first, I'd like to start out by giving a shout out to the very first Asian American figure skater from the United States, which uh, maybe some people don't know about, but it's Thai Babylonia. So just from her name or just seeing her, like a lot of people probably didn't realize that she is also of Asian ancestry, but her father is Filipino and her mother is black and she is a former world figure skating champion. And this was a little bit before my time, but she skated pairs in the late 70s and early 80s with uh, Randy Gardner. And then they, I think they had to withdraw from the Olympics. Um, it was very sad. I remember seeing footage of it, but she and Randy had to withdraw because Randy injured his foot or his leg or something. And so, you know, there's all this footage out there about, um, you know, her crying, they have to get off the rink and everything, you know. Um, there was also a TV movie about her life. And I remember seeing that. It was probably in the late 1980s where um, it was called the Tide Babylonia story. And what I really remember about it was that even though her father was Filipino, in the movie, they made her father a white guy. 
So, you know, I don't know if Ty had any say in that or something, but isn't that offensive? You know, like they changed history. That wasn't really the truth. I mean, why they couldn't find any Filipino looking people to play her father. So um, as far as I know, Ty Babylonia is um, coaching figure skating. She still looks great. I don't know how old she is, but um, whatever her genes are, she, she looks very young and vibrant. And I know she's been active in some sort of diversify ICE movement that Emmanuel Savory's brother has really been spearheading, trying to get more diversity, not just Asians, because you see Asians all over the place in figure skating now, but mainly um, African-American and Latino skaters trying to get kids interested in figure skating. Because I do want to emphasize that figure skating is a sport that can be enjoyed by everybody. Figure skating should be for everyone. And I encourage everybody out there, whoever you are, you know, if you are mobile, you can put on some skates, you got legs, you know, a little bit of sense of balance, you're not at high risk for a head injury or whatever, then um, definitely try figure skating or just get out there on a public session. It's actually very affordable for people who just want to do it recreationally because most skating rinks will have a deal where you just pay about $10 and that includes admission as well as rental skates. Um, but definitely, as I'll explain later, if you expect to be competitive or you want your kid to be competitive, you're going to start shelling out more and more money. OK, so um, back to the question, like, why are there so many Asian Americans in figure skating? So I've been mulling it over and I just made a very quick list. Um, first one is probably going to offend some people. But, you know, this is a sport. So, you know, I would say number one is because of body type. Um, like I said, figure skating or ice skating in general is a sport that or activity that everybody can enjoy. But if you or your child wants to be ultra competitive, you want to reach the upper echelon of the sport, well, take a look at the people who are winning all the medals, especially those little Russian girls that are all, you know, sweeping the podium now. They're doing quad jumps, triple axles are no big deal, you know, multiple quad jumps. It's just mind blowing. So um, really, you can see that it is helpful if you want to do those triple or quad jumps to have a very thin body to be short and little, you know. And I mean, I was thinking about this and then I suddenly remembered Nam Nguyen, who is actually a Vietnamese Canadian top skater, um, former Canadian national champ. He's been competing forever, but I think he's only like, I don't know, maybe 21 or 22 years old. It seems to me that Nam has been competing forever because Canadian men have not been as competitive. So it's been a lot of the same people constantly at the top, like Nam Nguyen and Kinga Messing and Roman Sadovsky. But Nam is kind of unusual in that he had a huge growth spurt, which kind of drew off his jumps. So I have, you know, it's kind of funny to say, but I've known tons of Vietnamese people, especially when I lived in California, and I have never seen or heard of any Vietnamese man that was so tall like Nam Nguyen. I think he's probably almost six feet tall. So whenever I see him skating, it's like, wow, it's so amazing that he's still able to jump and land his jumps and stuff. But typically the taller you are or the heavier you are, the harder it's going to be for you to maintain that axis in the air when you're doing multiple rotations and to be able to hoist yourself in the air. So, I mean, it brings to mind this quotation that I remember reading about that Raphael Artunian said. He's the coach of Nathan Chen. He also coached Adam Rippon. So um, Raphael said something like, how, how do you make elephants fly? Okay, so that was supposed to be sort of borderline offensive because I think he might have said it around Adam or in the presence of other skaters. Um, but it's true that if you want to progress past single and double jumps, if, if you're just too big or too chunky or something, it's just not going to happen. Um, you know, at, at my fittest point, I would often try to do these like jump rotations off ice. You know, you wear your sneakers and try to be on some sort of like rubber ground where you're not going to like totally injure yourself if you fall over. But the most I could get in the air would probably be like two rotations. So it's just mind boggling how these 
kids or these teenagers are somehow able to hurl themselves up in the air on ice and rotate around three or four times and then still land on one foot. Just so incredible. So if you have not actually seen a figure skating competition live, you should definitely try to if there's ever a competition that comes near you. And even a lower level competition is still pretty impressive. You know, sometimes you do see some competitive kids that are closer to your area who come in for smaller competitions. And um, many of them are doing triple jumps or double axles, which is just mind boggling when you can see it right in front of you. So, um, so that's the first thing that I think Asians in general tend to have um, a better body type um, for figure skating, you know, for high level figure skating. Um, I would also say diet, which, um, you know, I mean, it's just something that totally changes once people become more and more Americanized. I mean, I've, I've seen it myself with my own family or um, my own friends, other people who are from families of immigrants. You know, you come here to the U.S. and you're still eating pretty much Asian style meals like, um, you know, mostly rice and vegetables and then, you know, just a tiny bit of mead and nothing all cheesy and fattening or deep fried. Um, but of course, once people become more acclimated to life in America, then they all start eating more and more American food. Um, and then even now people say that in Asia, there's so much American food or Western food influence now. You see Starbucks and McDonald's and KFC everywhere. You know, people are eating donuts, there are bakeries. Um, you know, mochi donuts and sponge cakes and bread and everything. So, um, so definitely even across the world back in Asia now, you know, once people have more money and they're getting more influenced by American things or, or European things, then their diet is changing. Um, but I would say definitely, um, you know, maybe the Asian skaters or the Asian American skaters are more likely to still be eating a little bit more Asian style at home and therefore not taking in a bazillion calories and, you know, being served pizza and lasagna and fried chicken and meatloaf or ribs all the time. So, yeah, but um, in my family, unfortunately, I liked American food way too much. So when I was growing up, I was just eating a lot of Campbell soups and Swanson TV dinners and, you know, public school lunches. So, um, you know, I mean, a, a sad thing is that like most of my life, I have felt like a fat Asian person, even though, you know, to, to a regular American Joe Schmo, you know, they would be like, ah, oh, you're just average or you're, you're little or whatever. But um, even my siblings and I, we do say, things like whenever we go back to Taiwan, we just feel like big girls because, you know, people who are actually in Asia or just came over from Asia, most of them are like stick figures. You know, they're they're very bony and um, very, very thin. And um, very few of them have a problem with obesity like we have here in the United States. So body type and diet definitely play a role in um, success in competitive figure skating. So um, I did look up some statistics, if anyone's interested out there, that the U.S. obesity prevalence was 42.4% in the years 2017 to 2018, um, which was a huge increase because from, 20, from 1999 to 2000, the U.S. obesity rate was only 30.5%. So it jumped up almost 12% in less than 20 years. So I'm sure that's gone up even more in the last four years because, you know, since COVID happened, everybody talks about how they got COVID weight, you know, being less active, not going to a gym, sitting around the house even more, you know, just stuffing your face because you're feeling depressed after COVID. So um, yeah, so the adult obesity rate is, is at least 42.4%, but for Asian or people of Asian descent, Back then, it was only 17.4%. So I just mentioned that as one of the factors. Um, another factor is that figure skating, when you have a child who is ultra competitive and hoping to make it to nationals, it's very expensive. So I think pretty much everybody in the sport would agree with me that if you 
have a kid that is competitive and going around competing, testing, you know, even at say like the novice or intermediate level, it's still going to probably cost you at least $15,000 a year. And the reason it costs so much for figure skating is because this is a sport, you know, kind of obviously that you can't just go to your backyard and do figure skating. I mean, how many of us even have like a pond that freezes over or outdoor rink that mom and dad can set up? I mean, most of us don't. And even still, outdoor rinks are usually pretty shabby, you know, like the surfaces are all bumpy and, and bad for um, bad for your blades if you're a serious skater. So I personally never liked skating on outdoor rinks, even though they look fun. Um, so you have to pay for all that ice time. And for competitive skaters, you don't just go out on one of those cheap public sessions where you pay about $8 for admission or $10 for admission plus rental skates. You know, you have to go on a special freestyle session, which is only for higher level figure skaters. And usually for half an hour, it might cost about, say, like $12 to $15, maybe even more, depending on the locale. So um, most of the kids who are competitive are expected to skate five times a week, um, often more than one session. You don't want to just go there for half an hour and then that's it for the day. A lot of the kids go there in the morning and then they go there after school, depending on what the rink schedules are. So it requires a, a lot of money. The um, private coaches normally charge at least $30 for a half hour lesson. Some of them charge maybe even like 60 or more dollars for a half hour lesson. It, again, it depends on your locale and the qualifications of your coach. So um, most of the competitive kids also need to take a lesson, maybe say like five times a week. You know, I mean, it all starts small. You start with these like cheap um, group lessons that kind of rope you in and teach your kid the basics of skating. So that starts out maybe about a hundred dollars for a two month session of group lessons. But once your kid wants to do more than just a simple waltz jump or bunny hop or two foot spin, then it's time to start doling out the money for the private lessons. So um, I think in Asian American families, um, they're more likely to have say like a stay at home mom or, you know, parents where the, where the dad works and then the mom stays home and takes care of the kids. Um, you know, you have to live in a city that is actually, you know, skating friendly where there is at least one or two, preferably more rinks in the area. So that tends to be places where there are a lot more Asian Americans like Los Angeles, the Bay Area, around New York, Boston, um, you know, DC. You got to be at a place where there's actually a rink that your kid can go to since you can't it's not like soccer or basketball where you can just easily go out and practice anytime you want to so um of course that brings to mind um parental dedication because it's not just a kid the parents really have to want it and i think more asian american parents are more willing to let their kids especially girls you know try figure skating and um it's not just a matter of your child being talented and really wanting to do it because who's the one that has to shell out the big bucks for all the skating lessons and freestyle sessions and custom outfits, the custom boots, competition fees, club fees, you know, all that can really add up. And for some kids that are even more competitive at the highest levels, they can definitely spend more than $30,000 a year on figure skating. So um, for that tiny little chance of making it to nationals, maybe making it to the podium or even being able to compete internationally, you know, it's a very, very small smidgen of figure skaters that, that are even able to do that at the senior level. So, um, so as I mentioned, you know, I see in a lot more like Asian American families where um, the mother doesn't work or maybe the parents are self-employed so they do have that flexibility to be able to drive the kid to the rink in the morning and go get the kid from school early and drive the child to the rink to practice some more in the afternoon. So um, you have to have parents, the whole family has to really be into the sport, or at least you have to have at least one very devoted parent. Now I have heard that um, the high cost of figure skating and all the stress of having a child involved in the sport 
has um, worn down some families. Some people have gotten divorced or had marital problems, you know, fighting over whether figure skating is worth it or not for the kid. Um, I spoke in a live stream last year or more than a year ago about child support and um, sports in regards to child support law. And in that live stream, I covered a case involving a Vietnamese American figure skater whose um, parents had gotten divorced and they wound up all the way in the Court of Appeals in North Carolina because the father didn't want to pay for the figure skating expenses, but the mother had her child's coach come and testify about how, how much figure skating meant to the little girl and how she seemed to have a lot of potential and she was like one of the most talented kids at the rink and everything. So um, ultimately in that case, the court upheld the, um, the order where the father did have to pay a portion of the child's figure skating costs. But um, again, just looking at the case now and knowing what happened with that figure skater, it's like, okay, well, I think the coach was kind of exaggerating a little bit about what the what that child's chances were of even making it to nationals or making it big. I mean, you're spending tons and tons of money to be able to make it big. And, you know, even then, like, what does it mean to make it big in figure skating now? There aren't that many figure skating shows in the United States anymore, but I'm happy to hear that they are going to have stars on ice next year. But figure skating is really not that popular in the United States anymore. It's really popular in countries like Japan where you have the reigning two-time Olympic gold medalist Yuzuru Hanyu and tons of other Japanese figure skaters that are very well known. They're like celebrities out there. But for an American figure skater, you know, it's like even if you make it big, then what happens? You know, maybe you skate in some stars on ice shows, but then Later, it's not like, wow, you know, suddenly you've hit it big and uh, you've made back all the money that your family has spent on the figure skating career. So it definitely does require a lot of family dedication and a lot of financial resources in order to succeed in the sport. Yeah. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for being here. Um, so, of course, I have to mention the Quan factor. OK, so um, so even though, you know, a long time ago, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, we had Thai Babylonia, but um, a lot of people probably didn't realize she was Asian American or, or of um, part Filipino descent. And then we also had in the early 80s, Tiffany Chin, who was a U.S. national figure skating champion. And I think she was a world bronze medalist. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have my skating trivia handy, but um, I remember a long time ago in the 80s, reading an article in Young Miss magazine that my older sister had about Tiffany Chen. And it was like a, a picture of her like sitting down holding her ice skates and talking about Tiffany's skating career and everything. And I thought, wow, that that sounds pretty amazing because back then you very rarely saw any Asian American people or Chinese American people in these kinds of magazines in probably like the mid 1980s. So um, I started figure skating back in 1986 in Georgia because there was a rink that was about 20 minutes away from where we lived. But, you know, when you start figure skating at age 12, that's definitely way too old if you have any dreams of being a competitive figure skater. And there was no way my parents were going to spend all that money and all the time driving me to and from the rink every single day. I mean, it was it was like pulling teeth to even be able to go to a public session on the weekends to practice. So, so that's why I never went anywhere as a figure skater, but um, I got really into it as an adult later on when I could control my own, you know, finances and take myself to the rink and everything. But um, then we had Christy Yamaguchi when she won in 1992. Um, she inspired a lot of other skaters. Um, she's also been a mentor to Karen Chen, who is competing here at the U.S. Nationals. Um, but I think by and large, it's really Michelle Kwan that has um, made figure skating so popular amongst Asian Americans, especially those of Chinese descent, because a lot of those people and the, the women, usually it's women figure skating fans who saw Michelle Kwan out there skating and stuff. They're the ones who then decided, well, I'm going to let my kids go figure skating, too. This is a great sport. You know, you feel like there's a that maybe there's a level playing field that this is a sport that that your own kid could do when you see other role models um so i i, 
I mean, just speaking for myself, as well as a lot of my other Asian American friends who never, I mean, many of them, they don't even care about figure skating anymore now that Michelle Kwan has retired. So that's kind of sad. But um, when Michelle Kwan was in her heyday and her winning streak, which probably lasted about 10 years, which is unheard of these days, you know, she definitely inspired a whole new generation of Asian American skaters. And um, it's hard to believe that she is now 41 years old and a new mom. So, um, so once all these other people got inspired, then they started having kids. And I mean, I kind of feel like for, for Asian American parents, a lot of them, you know, they like the idea that um, figure skating seems like a fun, safer sport. You know, it's not like a contact sport like football where your kid could get pounded to pull or have a concussion. Well, they could have a concussion, I guess. Um, and again, jumping on a stereotype bandwagon, from what I've seen, a lot of um, East Asian parents, they do have their kids playing violin or playing piano. And so having that love of classical music kind of lends itself to them also liking the arts like ballet and figure skating, because in figure skating, you know, it used to be that everybody skated to classical music. So, um, I think the Shibutani's, um, Maya and Alex Shibutani, their parents were cellists, or they were definitely very into classical music. And um, I remember hearing that Nathan Chen also played piano or took piano lessons. Um, Jimmy Ma also played the piano. And I think he went to Carnegie Hall and played uh, a piano concert there. So, so very impressive. So that, that kind of ability or that love of classical music kind of ties in with the love of figure skating because, you know, in general, historically, figure skating has been done to classical music. So um, I think with all of these um, more and more role models and people seeing now, they're seeing Vincent and, and Nathan and all these other great figure skaters, Madison Chalk, um, Marai Nagasu, there's Jessica Callawang, who is Filipino American. She's so impressive, you know, just saw her compete in the pair short program. So I think the more you see these skaters out there, the more you see these like younger Asian Americans and their parents all becoming inspired too, thinking that, wow, there are so many people that sort of look like me that are doing this and they're doing great. You know, this is a good, good, wholesome sport. Um, you know, it looks good on your college applications, right? And um, it could be a sport where they can succeed. Um, oh, okay. Hi, Kayak 7 cs Thank you so much for being here. Oh, yeah, your daughter took piano lessons. Yeah, yeah. So impressive, right? Yeah, because you're always looking for more activities for kids to do, to keep them occupied, to let them burn off their energy. And, um, you know, again, with a lot of like Asian families, wanting to make sure that their kids get into Harvard or get into some top college or whatever, you know, why not have figure skating as the activity? Um, I think it is kind of an unusual activity, especially for boys. So um, I remember a long time ago telling a family friend that, that perhaps they should get their son who was Chinese, you know, involved in figure skating because the boys get treated like kings at the rink. You know, it's very rare to see a boy that even wants to go figure skating or take lessons, much less do something like ice dancing. So you'll see, um, even at nationals now, Karen Chen's younger brother, Jeffrey, is an ice dancer. So he's competing in the senior level and um, he's very impressive. He and his partner are, are pretty amazing also. So I look forward to seeing how they do in ice dancing. So, um, so yeah, you know, like every everybody has to find their niche or their favorite sport and what they are good at, what's good with their body type, also um, something that the whole family can get behind. So why not figure skating? So um, I would say if you have a son or you're a man or you're a boy out there watching this, um, you want to be popular, then take up figure skating. You know, like um, even in the adult figure skating community, there are a few men that do it. Um, and usually like everybody knows who the male figure skaters are, adult figure skaters are, because, you know, there are so few of them, especially if they're willing to um, do ice dancing or pairs and, you know, they know how to do the, the pairs, uh, I'm sorry, the ice dancing patterns and everything. 
um, they become like hot commodities and very popular at the skating rink when, when they are talented and willing to do that kind of sport. So, um, yeah. Oh, okay. She's half Asian, so we're sort of at the stereotype. Yeah, that's funny. Since we're talking about stereotypes here, yeah. So I think that just about covers it. Um, it looks like not many people have questions there in the box, but um, I'd love to encourage everybody to try ice skating. It's an Olympic year, so at least figure skating does get some more attention every four years when the Olympics roll around. And I'm definitely going to be cheering for all of the skaters there. Of course, you know, not just the ones of Asian descent. Um, I'm really, I'm looking forward to seeing how Jason Brown skates and how Ilya Malinin skates. This is his first time competing in senior men's at nationals. And he has quad jumps. And I think he's the future of U.S. figure skating. So, um Let's just tune in on Peacock TV or NBC. Here I am shilling for them. I'm not being sponsored. Oh, hey, Raj. Hi. Do you have any comments here? Oh, well, um, Raj, surprisingly, is one of the few subscribers um, to my channel who is interested in the legal content, but is also a figure skating fan. So that's really cool. Um, I do know of some adult figure skaters who are also lawyers, too. So. Um, you know, not like we talk about law or anything that's boring. We'd rather talk about figure skating. So um, so I should touch on also um, South Asian Americans because people are like, well, those are all East Asians. You know, they're like Japanese American or Chinese American or, you know, some of them are Filipino or Vietnamese. Well, what about the South Asian or the Indian, Indian figure skaters? So um, unfortunately, you know, as you can tell, India is not a hotbed of figure skating. So of course, with a lot of like, Asian immigrants in Canada and the United States, I mean, the parents there are most likely not going to think of, oh, you know, figure skating is a sport that I need to get my kid involved in and that I need to spend more than $10,000 a year on so my kid can be a figure skater. So, um, but then I do recall maybe more than five years ago, there was a documentary, you can probably still find it on YouTube about this um, teenage boy from India who was trying to make it to the Olympics as a figure skater. And I mean, it, I mean, it was kind of like a pie in the sky dream though, because they showed him doing just barely able to do a double lutz. And um, you can't go to the Olympics with double jumps these days. I mean, maybe back in like the 1960s or something, but, um, but you know, good for him for trying because there just aren't that many rinks around India. I'm like, I don't even know if he, trained in India or did he have to move to the United States or another country to try to learn figure skating and get some decent coaching. Um, and when I skated in Fairfax, Virginia, there was an Indian American girl named Ami Parekh who also trained at the same rink. This was when Michael Weiss, the um, world bronze medalist and US national champion was also training there at Fairfax Ice Arena. So Ami ended up um, switching to competing for India uh, for a while. I'm not sure how far she got, but um, she did have a very beautiful style of, of skating. She was very balletic. She was a little tall for a skater, um, but she was also very smart. So I think she wound up going to Princeton University and I'm sure she's doing like pretty amazing stellar academic, you know, cerebral stuff right now instead of figure skating. But um, she's basically the only Indian American figure skater that I've ever heard of in the United States. And then, of course, in Canada, we had Emmanuel Sandu, whose father was um, from India, but it sounded like he was kind of estranged from his father, and maybe his father didn't really support him that much. It was really his mother. I can't remember what ethnicity his mother was, but it sounded like she was also from a different country like Poland, maybe? I'm not really sure. But Emmanuel, you know, like he, he was also a positive role model too, because I'm sure there were plenty of other kids who had never seen an Indian American figure skater. And there he was winning the Canadian national championships. I think he might've won four continents or, you know, he did win some like bigger international competitions too. And I just loved watching him skate. He was very innovative, really cool and edgy. Um, and come to think of it, there is also another person, Ravi Walia, who is Indian Canadian. And the reason I remember him is because a um, long time ago, I 
spent a couple of weeks at the Lake Arrowhead figure skating campgrounds or whatever they called it. It was a facility where Michelle Kwan and her sister Karen also trained. This was in the heydays of Lake Arrowhead. So that summer, Ravi Walia and some of the other top Canadian skaters were there too. And of course, I was a really crappy skater. I was just basically there to help help them make more money, you know. <laughs> so uh, I was a very bad skater, but um, I had the privilege of, of being at the same rink and watching these top skaters like Ravi Walia and Ben Ferreira, um, Susan Humphreys, and um, Karen Kwan was there also um, training that summer. So it was very impressive. So Ravi is now a very successful figure skating coach in Canada. And I know he coaches some like very well-known Canadian female skater, but now I can't remember who it is. But I've definitely seen him on TV where he's like sitting there in the kiss and cry with his student. It was, it's not Gabby Dalleman, but hmm. now I'm drawing a blank as to who, who did he coach? Did he help coach Caitlin Osmond or somebody? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I thought of Ravi. He was, he was a really nice guy. I didn't really talk to him, but just like being around Lake Arrowhead and kind of observing and sitting around the rink a lot and stuff. He, he just seemed like a really nice, humble guy. Um, I've heard he's a great coach. People like him and stuff, you know, as opposed to some of those other elite skaters that seem like kind of uppity. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So Emmanuel Sandu's mom was a ballerina, Italian immigrant. Oh, yeah, yeah, he won the Grand Prix. Yes, I, I definitely remember that moment. Oh, okay, thank you. Wow, you're you're like full of skating trivia. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm very impressed that um, Michelle Kwan did, um, had, a, had a child um, on her Instagram. She was thanking a fertility clinic and mentioning something about fertility and IVF or something and how she wanted everybody to have hope. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, good, good for you. You know, there are so many people that are, deciding to become parents or become mothers at a later age. And um, you know, I still can't believe that Michelle Kwan is now a mom and in her 40s. So pretty, she still looks good though. Um, all right. So I um, hope that was an interesting bit of coverage about Asian American figure skaters. And we'll see how many people write some angry comments or, or inflamed by anything I said here. <laughs> but hope you guys enjoy watching the broadcast because um, later on tonight is going to be the U.S. Ladies Short Program. So I'm definitely going to be glued to Peacock TV um, really soon. And I hope you guys have a good evening. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I did hear about that. I was like, how can she be an ambassador now? I mean, she just had a baby. So maybe she can put it off for at least six months or something. Because, um, yeah, having a newborn baby is not really the time to be starting a new job overseas, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you all for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the skating to all the skating fans out there. And I do just have to throw in the legal thing, which is that every time I do skating stuff, it makes me appreciate being a lawyer even more. Because now that I'm self-employed, I can just pretty much work wherever I want to work. I was doing some work in the hotel today, just like talking on the phone, doing work at my laptop. And since I'm a self-employed solo attorney, I can pretty much do whatever I want as long as I don't have to go to court. So that's how I'm able to um, hopefully make it out to Nashville to watch figure skating. Okay, have a great day or have a great evening then and I'll see you guys at the next live stream. Thanks for being here. Hey Mike, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Have a good evening.